Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Second of 2013, um, I do have a sponsor who has a sponsor as well. Um, and I have been through the 12 steps, and I do have the privilege of sponsoring other women in this program, which is a beautiful, beautiful thing. Probably wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for Alcoholics Anonymous, just to throw that out there. Um, I did grow up in York, Pennsylvania, which is about two hours from here, but with Patty Burke's driving and directions, it took about three. So that's how we, that's how we got here. It was a fun ride, though. Um, so I grew up in York, Pennsylvania. Um, to a beautiful family, um, wonderful, loving family. Um, we had a lot of land, so I could pretty much do whatever I wanted. I have a older brother, so I always hung out with the guys when I was younger. Um, but growing up, I always hear people speak from the podium, like, I always felt different, or I didn't fit in, and I would chase things to make me feel better. And when I was younger, I really... I can't say I felt that way when I was, like, young, young, because I was always occupied, like, to keep me out of my mind, which is my problem. Um, so when I'm mad at myself, I'm perfectly okay. So, like, riding dirt bikes with my older brother, like, that was just what we did every single day, and it took me out of myself, and that worked for a really long time. I didn't know, I didn't have that non-fitting-in feeling that people talk about um, normally when they're younger. Um, but growing up, I... My parents were still together, um, and when I was about eight years old, my mother packed all of her stuff, and she was like, I'm leaving for a while, and wasn't sure why she was leaving. I didn't know anything about divorce. Like, I thought we were one happy family. Like, they seemed to hold it together when we were all together. Like, we'd have family dinners. Like, everything was just a perfect, like, I really had a perfect childhood. Um, then my mom left, and I'm stuck in this huge house. It was like a mansion, basically, that they got built together. Um, we're living in this house and it's just me and my dad and my older brother. And I was really confused. I was like, why did mom go? Like, I'm really confused. And I was going back and forth. So I was living out of a duffel bag and I would go to my mom's house, which was like an hour away from where I was going to school. And then the next week I'd pack the same clothes in the same bag and go to my dad's house and he would drive me to school every day. And that's just how I grew up. I thought that was like a mine, a normal life. Until I started to make friends in school, like when I was like eight years old and my, all of my friends are like, well, why do you drive an hour every morning to get to school? And I like didn't have answers and I started to get really confused about life. Like I thought when I was younger, like I saw my family, I'm like, this is what life is supposed to be like. And then when they got a divorce, I was just thrown off into like a whirlwind. Um, so then I had the options of either living with my father or my mother. And I wasn't sure, like, why they gave me that option, because I'm not very good at decision-making, and I found that out later in life. So I kind of was just like, I'll go wherever you need me to go. So I ended up moving in with my mother, and I had to change school districts. And this is when I started to get these feelings of not fitting in. Um, I moved into the school district. My brother ended up choosing to live with my father, and he went to school there, and I ended up living with my mother and it was me, my mom, and a lady roommate, we'll say that. Um, so I'm going to high school, and I really didn't start drinking until later on in life, but, I mean, not life, but in high school. So I was a little cheerleader. My mom went to school to be a gym teacher, so of course she says to me, she's like, Court, I'll coach you in any sport you want to play. Um, just let me know what sport you want to play. So every single sport she signed me up for, like, against my will. I had no idea what I was doing. Like soccer, she signed me up for, didn't work out too well. You're not supposed to pick the daisies in the grass when you're playing soccer. So that didn't work out very well for me. So she's like, I'll coach you in softball. So I'm like, all right, still really, really young. So I use a lot of these sports. My mom was always there with me. Like she's not controlling, but she was strict. So she always like, had me do, like, basically planned my days. Like, you're going to wake up, you're going to go to school, you're going to get all school, we're going to go to soccer practice, we're going to do this. Had my days planned. And I'm good with stuff like that. If someone plans my day, I am set. Um, until later on, I get to high school. My brother 
had some rocky times. My dad's a little bit more lenient, so my brother's getting into a little trouble. He decides that the father's the problem. He needs to move in with mom. So he moves in with us, and living together, me and my brother are like, almost the same to like the core and I now see that today we are we are exactly the same to the core um my brother was starting to like act out and I always like behaviors that he was doing like when my father would be like do not take the four-wheelers out today like my holy communion was the next day he's like don't take the four-wheelers out and like influencing my brother's like let's go sneak the four-wheelers out I'm like no I don't think we should do that we shouldn't do that of course, I get on the four-wheeler, and all bets are off. I'm out on the four-wheeler. My dad also says don't go to the mud pit, um, and that's what me and my brother together to do together. So we're not very good influences on each other. We, we're not very good. Um, so he moved in with us uh, at my mom's house, and he starts going to middle school with me. And I was still very confused. Like my mom, it was my mom, my roommate, my mom's roommate, me, and my brother all living in this house. And this lady lived with us, like my mom's friend, lived with us for quite a while. Like, as soon as she moved out, like, she, this lady moved in. And I remember being on the school bus, and my brother started screaming on the bus, like, my mom's gay, my mom's gay. And I am just head in my lap, like, just wanting to vomit, vomit. Because, like, at 10 years old, it's not cool then. But when you're, like, 15, like, that's the age where it's like, yeah, like, my mom's gay. Like, it was cool. My brother was getting, like... A lot of reactions from people, which he was good at. So he thought it was really cool to tell everybody in my middle school that he just moved to. He didn't know anybody, and that's how he starts his first day of school out, telling everybody on the school bus that my mom's gay. I had no idea what that meant. I just knew that my mom had another lady living with us for a very long time. Had no idea. And I do know from that point on, I hid that feeling, like dumped that feeling inside of me. And people would ask me, they're like, I heard your mom's gay. And I'd be like, nope, mm -mm. my mom's not gay. It's her roommate. We can't pay the rent, so she's helping. That was always my go-to. Like, I didn't want anybody to know because I thought it would ruin my reputation because this is new school for me. Like, And I thought my brother was coming in and ruining it. Um, so I remember just being in high school all the time, like sweat pit stains down to, like, my hips because I was so... Like, I would leave my arms like this so nobody could see them because I'd be so paranoid that if I'd raise my hand, someone would see my sweat stains, and then it would just be a panic attack all day long. That's how I lived my life through middle school. My brother ended up moving back to the other school, so life started to get a little bit better. I joined the cheerleading squad, which my mom was not happy about because she said she could coach me in any sport, and I decided to be a cheerleader. So my mom's like, that's not a sport, but okay. She supported it. She became the cheer mom, decked out jackets, brought the girlfriend with her and decked out jackets. And that's how life went for a little while. And it worked. Like, cheerleading filled my void for a good, good period of time until all the cheerleaders were talking about. I remember my brother getting into trouble. Um, I would go down to my dad's house, like, every once in a while to visit. And I just remember... Like I went to a high school dance, or a middle school dance, and I won this chocolate bar because I danced the best. And I'm not talking about, like, twerking. I'm talking about, like, I don't even know what it was. Like, I can't, still can't dance to this day, so I don't know how I won this chocolate bar at the dance. But I was really excited. And I came home, and I just wanted to, like, show my brother that I won a chocolate bar at the dance. And I go to find him. And I couldn't find him. I'm, like, running through the house. I'm, like, where is he at? I just want to show him my chocolate bar. And it's, like, 11 o'clock at night, which is past my bedtime to be in, like, seventh grade. So I go into the bathroom, and I have a bunch of, like, girlfriends over, like, that went to the dance with me, and I remember walking into the bathroom, and I see, like, a blue face, bottle of vodka sitting on the tub, and just vomit, head straight up, and vomit just coming out of his mouth with another buddy just in the tub, completely wasted. I was probably 12 then, and I swore to myself, once I saw that, and I couldn't, my dad locked his door, and I couldn't get a hold of my dad. I had no idea what to do once I saw this, like, visual of my brother, like, in this tub, like, I thought he was dying or dead already. Fine. So I had to call the cops, and I finally got my dad, and it was just the most terrible sight I've seen. So I swore to myself from that day, I'm like, I never want to be like my brother. I never said, like, I never want to drink. I just said I never want to be like my brother, which involved drinking. Um, so I do the whole cheerleading thing, and... Going through high school, I was scared. Like, I was full of fear my entire life with the whole pit stains and just wondering what everybody's thinking about me. Like, what is she going to say to me? And I just remember sitting behind the most popular girl in school and just 
staring at her highlights. I'm like, I'm going to have that one day. And she had really long hair, and I, my mom gave me a perm, so I have a little Pomeranian haircut, just wanting to have the same hair. And she was head of the cheerleading squad. I'm like, i got to be like her one day. And I just sit behind her and just sweat, wanting to be like her. It was, it was terrible. And so cheerleading kind of helped out with that. And I do remember when I was in cheerleading, the decision skills that I make, like if there's more important engagements than cheerleading practice, I will find a way to get out of cheerleading practice. So my bright idea that pops in my head, I'm like a friend, I wasn't even drinking this, like ninth grade, I would say, and not even drinking, um, had prior engagements. I guess they were having a bonfire. I was scared of alcohol because of the sight that I saw with my brother that the head captain came up to me and she's like, court, we need to get out of cheerleading practice. And I'm like, did she really just talk to me? Like she just spoke to me. So I felt that I had to get us out of cheerleading practice somehow. So my bright idea is to call the cheerleading coach, like from a a different number, like block the number and call the cheerleading coach and tell her that I was going to gut all of her cheerleaders like a fish if they showed up to practice today. That's where my thinking gets me. I don't know. I'm 13, 14 years old and telling this lady I'm going to gut her cheerleaders like a fish when I'm one of them, which I would never do. I'm too full of fear to even attempt to do that. But that's where my thinking gets me. So got out of cheerleading practice, and I go to this bonfire, and the most popular girl, I see her drinking a wine cooler. And I'm like, go up to her, and I'm like, I don't know if I should tell her about my brother's story. Like, I guess that's not something you tell normal people. Like, you guys think it's funny, and I think it's funny now. But, like, normal people don't think that's funny. They're like, he needs help. And I'm like, this is awesome. Like, I thought it was going to be, like, you shouldn't drink. Like, I saw my brother in a bathtub. And I tell her this story, and she's like, oh, my God, like, get away from me. Like, because I'm telling her, I'm like, you're going to end up in a bathtub. You're going to end up in a bathtub, and you're going to be vomiting. And because I was petrified, and I see her drinking this wine cooler, and it just looked so attractive to me. So um, she hands me a wine cooler, and this is at a big bonfire, like, I guess we lost our football game. I would have assumed that we lost our football game. Normally, every Friday, they do this bonfire, so... Um, everybody's drinking these like wine coolers because I guess that's all you get. We're 14 years old. So she hands me a wine cooler after I just told her the story about my brother. And I'm like, okay, she handed me, I should probably drink this. Like they're drinking it. I didn't know what alcohol does. I had no idea anything, the effects produced by alcohol. I knew nothing. I just knew that I saw my brother like that and I did not want to be like that, but didn't matter. I wanted to fit in. So I took that wine cooler and I drank it. I do not remember getting drunk. I don't remember any other feeling. I drank one wine cooler. Um, but they, she talked to me. Like, she ended up getting drunk, so I was her best friend for the night because I got us off the cheerleading, and it, it was just great. And I was like, I need to chase this. I tried to make that same night happen every Friday night. That's what my life began. Even though I was too scared to drink, I drink a wine cooler, and I try to just make that happen because I felt a part of like even being with those people, the comfort of that took my void away. Um, until I want to say like sophomore year of high school, the next year I was captain of the cheerleading squad and I felt I had to be in that girl's shoes, which she was drinking a lot more. She was falling over. She was falling in the fire and everybody was talking to her. I don't know if they were trying to like help her because she was like too drunk, but I'm like, I need to be just like that. And I seeked the people that were just like that. Like, it just seemed, all the cool people were the people that were drinking, it seemed like, in high school. So I did chase that, and I ended up being a blackout drinker. From that second year, I'd drink one wine cooler until that, the next year, I would blackout every time I drank. Every single time, like, just putting the alcohol in me. I I had no off button. There was no off button, and that's at age 14. And I had no idea what was wrong with me. I just knew that, Once I was in blackout, I didn't have to worry about anything. Like, I didn't care what they were thinking because I didn't know what I was thinking. I wasn't thinking because I was in a blackout. And I just hear, like, the next morning, and I'm 15 years old. My mom's really strict, so, like, lying, trying to get out to go do these things that I do. And I really didn't have consequences. So for all of high school, I really got away with a lot of stuff. And every time I drank, I blacked out. And I didn't know what a blackout was. I just knew that by 10 o'clock on, I don't remember anything. And I was okay with that because I was out of me. Um, I did get to college. Like I maintained very good grades in high school. Like 
I got out half days to go to work. I was still maintaining a job. Like it was only like a Friday night thing because I couldn't do this every single night. So I didn't think that I had a problem. Like that was not even an issue. I had no consequences. I was doing great in school. Like life was good. Drinking was one of my favorite things to do. I absolutely love drinking. Um, I remember older in high school, like maybe senior year, everybody um, was signing up to go to college. And I'm like, I really should just stay at community college. Like, I know where I can get booze around here. Like, I don't mm -hmm. know. Being, like, especially moving, like, the first thing that came to my mind was, like, how I moved from middle school to a whole school district. I was completely petrified. I'm like, I can't go to college. I'm not going to know anybody. I'm going to have to meet new people. And I'm full of fear. Like, me alone running on myself, like, I'm scared of anything and everyone. Like, to go in and be placed with a random roommate, like, is not happening. Like, I don't know what to say to her. She doesn't know what to say to me. I can't get changed in front of her. I have to go to the bathroom to change. Like, I was just scared. Like, I worried the whole summer. And that's when my drinking picked up. Like, when I have something on my mind, whether it's a good day, a bad day, or uh, any kind of day, like, just gave me an excuse to drink. And still, my family was not, like, aware of what I was doing. Like, I was hiding it very, very well until I went away to college and my mom was the kind of person she was like the strict mom so she had me like make my bed in the morning when I was at home when I got to college I knew nothing about living absolutely nothing like I didn't have someone telling me when to go to bed I didn't have somebody telling me when to get up when to go to classes and I was like scared like completely scared um until I get to college, my mom when she went to college she went to Lock Haven University she had a roommate in college to be a phys ed teacher um and they had a daughter and a son the same age as me and my brother. And we were all very, very close growing up. We'd go to family functions together. Like, we were just, like, one big family, her roommate from college. So I call this girl, and I'm like, hey, like, are you going to go to college? And it just so worked out that we applied at the same college, and we applied to be roommates in the same dorm. So I had somebody that I could be comfortable with. And I just remember walking into the first day of college. My mom dropped all my stuff off, and she, like, left. And I'm sitting on my bed, and I look at my roommate which was my best friend at the time. And I look at her, I'm like, do you drink? And she's like, yes. And I'm like, awesome. Like, we are best friends now. So college was really my takeoff point for this. Um, I still didn't know what alcoholism was. My family really didn't drink. Like, my mom had told me, like, now that I've been sober, my mom has told me, she's like, I never drank when I was younger until Father's Day. My dad's like, did you hear about your mom beating some man with a shoe? Like, it's funny, like, my mom tried to tell me, she's like, I don't drink, what happened to you? And I'm hearing stories now that she used to get completely wasted and beat little men up because she's, like, 6'4". It's pretty funny. But um, I'm in college, and I'm actually doing real well. My first semester, I did phenomenal, but drinking was every single day. Like, as soon as I hit college, it was an everyday thing. I had nobody with rules. I didn't have anything. So wake up in the morning, I would beer bong, a beer, what was left over from the night before, just like sitting that was completely warm, beer bong a beer and just go to class. And I got extremely good grades my first semester until the next semester we moved out of the dorms and moved into an apartment. And this became like the party apartment, like go to Courtney's house, like that's where it's at tonight, like kegs in the closet. I remember like we didn't know how to tap a keg. I mean, I just wanted to drink it. So we used to use a screwdriver because we had no idea how to get the keg tapped. Like, we didn't, we forgot to get the tap, but we had the keg. So we pried it open with a screwdriver and poured it into this big barrel. And we had this yingling lager in this barrel, like, closet of our apartment that people would just take solo cups and just scoop it in. And I'd be like, $5. $5. I make great money. Like, that's a great way to make money, charge them $5 for a scoop of stale, skunked yingling lager. But they love it. Um, so it worked out well, worked out well. That was my job for about six months. Lost that job when the keg ran out and we didn't have any money. But, uh, drinking, I saw that it started to become a problem. I didn't, still didn't know anything about drinking. I know my brother was in and out of jails at this point. Um, he got two DUIs in a matter of me being a sophomore in college. Um, I just thought like he was going off that going on a different path than me. Like, I went to college. I succeeded my first year. Second year didn't go as planned. Um, drinking took over every area of my life, every area of my life. Um, to go to the gym, I needed a beer in me. Like, I feel like I can run faster on the treadmills with a yingling in me. Like, doesn't work like that. Um, 
just random stuff like school events, like going to a basketball game. I live on a dry campus, by the way. So I go to basketball events, and I'm, like, wasted at the events. They're like, you know, this is a dry campus. Like, you're not supposed to be drunk on this campus. Like, nobody could tell me anything. Like, drinking completely took over my life. It was the only thing to get me out of me. Like, I don't know how to make decisions. And when a drink is in me, it makes my decision. And that's to drink more. And then not know. So I'd wake up in the morning. People tell me, like, oh, you were laying in the pavilion till 4 a.m. We had to carry you to your room. Like, I didn't care. I'm like, was I heavy? Like, do I need to go to the gym today? Like, what are you trying to tell me? Like, thanks for letting me know. And that's, that's what my life had became, became. And, like, that still wasn't my bottom. Like, I was just like, okay, like, maybe college isn't for me. Like, it's not working out. I should probably go home. Like, I was thinking home would be my best bet until all of my friends were like, this is at Penn State, by the way, like a branch campus. And all of my friends, like, you do a two-year program and they go up to state college. So all of my friends are like, oh, yeah, we got enough credits. We're going to state college next semester. And that feeling just came over me. I'm like, what am I going to do? Like, all my friends are succeeding. Like, I didn't even get enough credits because I had to drop, like, seven classes before graduation. So they show up as Ws, not as Fs, because if you withdraw, you don't fail. And if I take my report card home, it's a W, so I get away with it. With my mom, I'm like, it was just too much. Like, I lost the book. Like, random stuff. Like, just completely lying just letting alcohol take over. Um, so all my friends are going up to state college. I feel like it'd be a great idea. I found a boyfriend at this time. Um, poor thing. Uh, he ended up, he's like, why don't you move in with me? And he had enough credits. And I feel like he wasn't that smart. Like, I felt I was like a genius. And especially when I'm drinking, I'm even smarter. dude. And I'm like, I don't know how I'm with this kid. And like, how did he get enough credits? And how is he doing good? I guess he's going for, like, agriculture, so, like, I'm like, I can grow stuff, too, like, attempted that as well. Um, <laughs> but he was going for agriculture, and I'm like, all right, this may be a fun deal. Like, I'm going to tell my mom I got enough credits, and I'm going to go up to state college and just live with you for a while. And he thought it was a great idea. He wanted me there, so I move up to state college, and I am there for maybe six months before... He leaves to go to class, and I was drinking every single day. Like, I bought a cat because when he'd go to school and I couldn't get booze, because I still wasn't 21, I couldn't get booze for the day. Like, I would sit there miserable, absolutely miserable. Like, me without a drink is the most terrible thing you could ever see. Like, I am not a fun person to be around, and I assume that when I'm drinking, I'm not a fun person to be around either, but I thought it was great, and I had no feeling, no emotions, no nothing. I didn't have to think about anything when I drink something. So I'd sit there in this house with no alcohol, no nothing, with him at class. And I'm like, what, what am I doing with my life? So I'm like, I'm going to get a cat. Like, a cat will keep me busy. Like, it'll fill this void while I don't have booze until he gets off to go get me liquor. So I lived with this cat, basically, for a good five months. And that cat filled my void for, like, an hour a day, maybe, just petting my cat and... I got a job, like, I was really excited. I got this job at Ruby Tuesdays, and I'm, like, serving college students, which was great. I'm great at alcoholics are really great at serving other drinkers. So I'm like, yeah, you know you want a liquor pitcher. Like, I'm very good at selling alcohol to people. I know that to this day. Um, so, like, I just work at Ruby Tuesdays, come home, play with the cat, wait for him to get booze, and that's how I lived my life. Like, I really had no purpose, no purpose in life. Like, I was just living to drink, and I thought that's what my life was like, I thought that's what life was. Like, I saw my brother's life, and I'm like, well, that's what he's doing. Like, and my, I remember my mom, I came home, and she should, she could just see. Like, when you drink for a while, like, you can see it in somebody. Like, you're not the same. Like, I was smoking cigarettes then, like, all the time, when I still do. But um, I just remember my mom looked at me when I came home to visit, and she was like, you look terrible. Like, what are you doing with your life up there? And that's when I had to sit down and tell her, like, Mom, I really haven't been taking class. Like, I tell her every day. I'm like, yeah, I had anatomy today, like anatomy like what'd you learn and I just like look at the cat and I'm like learn we, we dissected a cat today like I just totally made up that we dissected a cat I think till the day that she, today like I think I did dissect a cat at some point in my life I don't remember I'm a blackout drinker guys it's really hard um so I just remember like I'm like yeah I dissected a cat today and she's like oh like that's cool like she believed all my lies like she had so much faith in me and like she set me up like gave me the perfect light to succeed. So everything that I told her, she had no reason not to believe because I wasn't doing these actions around her. I was too scared to see my mom see me the way that I'm living. Because I didn't even want to see the way I was living. That's why I was a blackout drinker. That was a reason for drinking. I enjoy the effects produced by alcohol. That is my reason for drinking. And 
I remember this kid goes to class and I just get this great feeling. I'm like, I don't want to be in this relationship anymore. I'm like, I need something different. I need to change. I need to get back home. Like, I need to do something different. So he goes to class. He has no idea. I tell him I love him, give him a kiss. I'm like, see you when you get home. And it was like a week before Thanksgiving, packed all my crap, and I'm just out. Took the cat, too. Um, and I come home, and my mom's like, what are you doing here? And I moved in with my mom for maybe five months. My mom saw the way I was living. I lived in her basement. Um, my first week there, she's like, you can live here for free. She thought I was doing great. Started paying me rent to live in the basement because she saw the way I was living. She's like, I'm not condoning this. I'm not being an enabler. You're going to pay rent to live here. You're going to be a tenant of mine. I'm not going to be your parent. I'm not going to tell you what to do. You're going to be a tenant. Still didn't stop me. I remember my mom coming down at like five o'clock in the morning when she's getting up to go ready to get ready for work. And I just strolled in the night before at like three thirty, four o'clock in the morning. And in a blackout, my mom tells me that I like curse her out. I spit in her face. Like I had no reason to do that. My mom loved me. She cared about me. And for me to do these actions to her, I had no control over anything anymore. Like alcohol had taken over. Um, I ended up, my mom was like, I can't do this anymore. Like I can't watch my daughter die in the basement of my house. Like I'm not doing it. She needed to shut that door. And I'm so grateful that she did shut that door. I actually moved in with a friend that I was working at a nightclub with selling jello shots. Um, she was like, well, why don't you move in? They redid this whole house. So I move in. I turned that into a complete flop house. Like that was my chance to like jump off, like start a life, like try and save money to go back to school. Like I had the best intentions to straighten my life out. Um, so I move in with her and I had no furniture. I'm living in a cot. Like I was planning on making this my house, like get a dresser. Nope. I had two garbage bags full of clothing, a trunk full of clothing, a racked up car that I ran into like random things with. Like I, my whole life was just a mess on the outside. Like it wasn't just the mess on the inside anymore that I was feeling like the whole mess. Like it was completely obvious that I had a problem. Um, so I ended up living with her for about two months, maybe. And I go to the beach and so I was working at a place in New York and all these people, like they party together, like we're going to the beach this week. And I'm like, all right, I'm coming. So I ended up going to the beach. I get a DUI at the beach and I'm sitting in the holding cell. They put a post-it note while I'm sleeping there overnight. It was like Easter week and a post-it note that says quality in room 122. And I had this sudden ease, like I had no alcohol in my system for 24 hours. And I'm sitting there before I saw the post-it note and I was just a nerve wreck, like no alcohol, like shaking, like a complete mess until I saw that post-it note on the door to know that I had one more night to party in Ocean City, Maryland. It was like that ease and comfort, like when you know you're getting a drink. It was so weird, like looking back on it, like I didn't know that that was like the ease that I was going to get a drink in me. Um, so I had this ease and I remember going to that quality Inn, and there was two Miller Lite pounders waiting for me when I walked in, knowing that I just got a DUI the night before. I'm like, what great friends do I have? Like, these are awesome people that buy me pounders when I'm getting out of jail. So I get home, maybe two weeks later, I get DUI number two. Um, still not realizing there's a problem. Um, I show up to my grandmother's house. She's living in a nursing home. I'm like, Graham, I have nowhere to go. She's like, I live in a nursing home. I'm like, but you have free ice cream on tap all day. What are you talking about? I can't stay here. It's free meals. Like, come on. She's like, nope, I can't, I can't do this. And my brother had been in and out of institutions and jails. Um, he was dating somebody that was in a recovery house. I had no idea there were recovery houses in York. My brother's like, here, take this phone number. You can live there for a short amount of time until you go to court, and then you'll be able to move out of the recovery house and drink the way you want to drink again. I said, that's a great idea, brother. Why haven't I listened to you my whole life? Um, so I call this recovery house. They tell me they're going to take my cell phone, my car, and I have to be home every night at 10. I'm like, all right, I will call you back later. I'm going to see if there's any non-stricter ones. So I called a couple more. There was one that said you can have your phone and your car, but you have to be home by a certain time. I'm like, all right, that one's a little better to do. I'll be all right with the one that I just have to be home. I can drive and I can do everything else that I need to do. Um, so I move into this recovery house. I know nothing about recovery, absolutely nothing. Um, still don't think that I have a problem or don't think that I'm a problem. Um, so I move into this recovery house, and it kept me sober for a good six months. I was in this recovery house. I was going to four meetings a day morning, afternoon, two night meetings every night, like four meetings a day. You'd think that I'd get it. No, didn't get it. I was miserable. These girls, like, 
I walk in and the girls, like I have a bow in my hair and I have like my Penn State cheerleading jump jumpsuit on. Like I just came from like a cheerleading competition. They're like, do you cheer for Penn State? I'm like, four years ago I did. And they just laughed at me like I was a complete mess. Like I was just trying to impress these girls. And they are on this journey like to get happy. They are happy. They sit at the kitchen table and read the big book every night. I had no idea what the what a big book was. And they'd sit there and read it, and they invited me. The first night I was there, they invited me. They're like, come read the big book with us. And I just wanted that feeling of acceptance. Like, it gets me out of myself when I'm doing things. So I'm sitting there um, at the big at the table reading a big book, and every girl's, like, taking turns reading paragraphs. And I'm like, what is this? Like, I mean, I guess the meetings that I was going to, I was going to, like, meetings outside of town because I really didn't know people. Like, I would just go to these meetings, sit by myself, not say a word, not listen to a word anybody was saying, and then I'd leave, and it'd keep me sober for that hour. And I did that for six months straight. I was miserable. I thought that that was, was going to keep me sober. That's all I knew of AA. That's all I was willing to learn about AA. Um, until I had the eligibility. I go to court, and I thought I was going to get out early. I'm like, okay, I did three months in this recovery house. Like, is there any way that I can get out soon? And I'm sitting there on stand in Ocean City, Maryland, and the judge is like, I'd like you to finish out your six-month program in your recovery house, and my head just dropped. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. And I remember sitting in that courtroom, and for a second DUI, like most people get jail time, this guy looked at me, the judge looked right at me, and he's like, all I want you to do is finish out your six months in this recovery house, and you won't lose your license, like all this stuff. Like he basically like let me off the hook, didn't have to do jail time, just had to do this recovery house. And the judge says to me, as I'm walking away from the stand, like my heart is kind of smiling because I knew I could stick it out in the recovery house. He said, I just want you to know that God's in the room right now. And that like, I was really confused why he said that because I'm like, what do you mean? Like I still have to sit in this recovery house for another three months. And now I see like what a great blessing that is. When I see other people getting two DUIs and so much stuff they have to go through, like God was in that room. And I was right where I needed to be. Like I needed to do that six months in the recovery house or I would not be where I'm at today. I learned how to live in this house, like not necessarily taking suggestions from anybody because I wasn't willing to like ask somebody for help because I'm too full of fear. Like my life is ran on fear without a solution. Um, so as I'm living in this recovery house, like I learned how to make my bed, which I never knew how to do. Like I was a blackout drinker. Like I was going to get in it regardless, probably in the afternoon to take a quick nap. Like why make my bed? I learned how to make my bed. I learned how to do a chore every single night. I learned how to do other people's chores. Um, I learned how to do dishes when I use them, like random things that I didn't know I was learning in this house. I'm just going through the motions, like hoping, hoping that I could maybe be as happy as the girls that I'm living in this house with. And I'd see my roommate. I remember one night I'm, I'm sitting in bed and I'm just miserable, absolutely miserable. And this spiritual malady is just growing and growing. And I don't, didn't know what that was, but now I can see like, it was just growing. I didn't know what it was. I just felt this hole in the soul that like, wasn't ever going to fix. Like I thought that's what my life would be. Like I'd have to keep myself busy 24 hours a day in order to recover from what I was suffering from. Um, so I looked at over at my roommate and I'm laying in bed and she's reading the big book and I'm just really confused. I'm like, what is she reading in that book? Like, what is there that important in a book? Like, unless I'm forced to read a book, I don't read books. And she's like reading it and she's like happy and she's smiling and she's on the phone with this lady every single night. And then as soon as she gets off the phone, she gets down on her knees and she prays. And I'm like, what is she doing? Until one night she asked me, like, I always felt so awkward. I'm like, should I shut my eyes when she's praying? Should I look the other way? Should I face the wall? Like, should I get on the floor too? Like, what do I do? Like, turn the lights off? Like, does it help her? Like, is God here? Um, so it'd be really, I was so confused what she was doing. And I'm like, wait, like, one night she asked me, she's like, Court, do you want to pray with me? And I kind of was just like iffy about it. I'm like, I don't know if this is a good idea. I'm like, I'm, I'm, I grew up in a Catholic. Like my mom was Catholic, forced to go to church every single Sunday. So I was always taught, like, not taught. I mean, what I perceived of the experience was if I don't do this, this, and this, like God's going to do this, this, and this. So basically I had this thought of like a dooming God. And I was unwilling at this point to open my mind to anything else. But for some reason, I was just like, sure, I'd love to. Because I had no other solution. Like, I was removed from the drink, and I was still a nutcase. Like, I didn't know what was going on. So I get down on my knees, and she's like, would you like to say anything? And I'm too petrified. I'm like, absolutely not. Like, you can say something for me, though. 
And she kind of just looked at me and she's like, it's okay. Like, it's okay. And I, and just smiled. I'm like, what do you mean it's okay? Like, you just said like 500 words to God. And I said nothing. Like, what's, what's going to happen to me now? Like, I'm probably not going to wake up tomorrow because you put me on the spot and I didn't think about what I was going to say to God tonight. Thanks. And that was just my thinking. Like, I thought that's what was going on inside my recovery house every night. Um, so I thought it'd be a great deal. Like I could not take the pain any longer. And obviously without a solution, I'm going to drink again. And that is exactly what happened. And I did get away with it in my recovery house, which I did have to make amends for. Um, and the owner of the house thought I was doing great. Like I was going out drinking every weekend, like harming all the girls in my house, coming home wasted. The one knew she's like, I smell vodka on you. I'm like, what are you talking about? You can't smell vodka. Like somebody told me you can't smell vodka. That's why I drank it tonight. And she's like, Courtney, you can smell vodka. So she knew the whole time, and this is my roommate, and she still invited me to pray with her every night. And I was so confused. I'm like, why isn't she telling on me? Why isn't she, like, like turning her back on me? Because I'm not doing the right thing. And I knew it wasn't the right thing until, and I'm still going to meetings every day, four meetings a day. Um, and then I finally begged my recovery house owner. I'm like, can I move to a sober house so I have less rules? Which is not what I needed, but it's what I wanted. So I was like, can you please move me over? So he moves me over to a sober house, and I end up being in the sober house. Everybody's sober, like, a good year. And I'm like, how do they do it? Like, how do they do it? Until one night I went out in Harrisburg, and I lost my car. I lost my keys. I lost myself. Um, Didn't know where I was, laying on the side of the street. I had to call a sober member of Alcoholics. Like, that feeling of knowing that nobody else is there but somebody in AA. And I'm like, started to click. I'm like... There's a reason I'm here. Like, I wouldn't be here if there was no reason behind it. And so I get home, and this girl's like, you really need to figure something out. She's like, what don't you have that other people in this room have? And I'm like, a sponsor. I don't have one of them yet. And she's like, you might want to get on it. She's like, I've heard my um, my my grand sponsor heard from his sponsor, which is a great grand sponsor, He said it from the podium last week. He said, we're all on borrowed time. And that's exactly what my roommate basically was saying to me. Like, we are on borrowed time. Like, we wouldn't be here if we weren't on borrowed time. We don't deserve the life that we're living now. Like, this time is borrowed that God gave to us to grow from what we had experienced. So that kind of hit a bell, and I'm like, okay, I'm going to probably get a sponsor. So I find my sponsor on Facebook, and I'm like, all right, this is going to go great. Message her on Facebook. I'm like, hey, can you help me? And I thought that I could do this over a Facebook message. I'm like, we are a technology-based community. Like, I'm going to get through the steps through Facebook. So I messaged her. I'm like, uh, hey, can you help me? I thought she was going to, like, go over one, two, and three, like, over the phone. She's like, call me at three. And I'm like, I got to call you? Like, we got to talk? Like, I got to see you? Like, I was so scared. I was petrified. But I was willing to change. Like, that last night out was the most miserable night, like, Like I said, like, I lost my car, my keys, my phone, but, like, in all reality, I lost myself. Like, there was no more left of me. I was just a being. Um, So I asked her for help, and she ended up meeting up with me. Like, the next day, she was like, do you want to go to a meeting tomorrow? And I said, of course. And I've never gone to a meeting with other girls. Like, I always just take myself, sit in the back, not do anything. Um, She took me to, actually, my home group, um, and right after the meeting, did one, two, and three. And it was just crazy. Like, I didn't, I really didn't understand what I was doing. I was just going through the motions. Like, I knew I needed to do something different. So that's why I'm like, I'm willing to do do something different. Whatever you tell me to do, I'm willing to do. And it was kind of like pulling teeth. Like, I couldn't plan my day. Like, I'd call her in the morning. I'd be like, I have a day off. What do I do? Like, do I get it? Do I go to a meeting? Like, what do I do? She had to plan my days for me. Like, that's how sick I was. I didn't know how to live at all. Um... Until I got to my four-step, and I thought that I had so many people that I absolutely hated and resented, and, like, so I make this list, and we do it a little different way, but the way we did it, like, it left no room for air. Like, I had to be completely thorough the way that we do this, like, through a worksheet. Like, it asked me, and I sat down, and she was like, invite God in. I'm like, I'm actually going to try this for once. Like, my own words to God, I'm going to try it. Like, I'm going to see if this works. So I sat there, I'm like, said just like a quick prayer because I didn't know what to say. I was kind of scared of God. Um, So I'm like, please write through this pen what I need to write so that I can thoroughly do my four-step. And within then, my pen just started going. My whole four-step was done. 
Um, I meet up with her to do a fifth step. And basically when everything started changing was when I did my, like when I came home and spent my hour with God. Um, I didn't know what I was talking to. I didn't know I was giving my defects to. I didn't know anything that I was doing. She just told me this prayer and I said this prayer and I just remember like this, this hole just slowly getting smaller. And it's really weird. Like when I hear people like before I got like sober and started like experiencing like happiness, um, I'd hear people talk, they're like, yeah, it was getting small. And I'm like, what are they talking about? Like, I had no idea what anybody was talking about until I started to live it. Once I went through that experience, everything made sense. Like my whole world was different. Like going to meetings, like I understood what they were talking about. And like, I understood when they're like, yeah, God did this. And like the feelings they were feeling, like I just felt more connected at meetings and I started meeting more people, making great friends. Um, until she took me all the way through my steps, I made, um, I thought that I was going to have, like, more people that, like, I was, like, resentful at. I really had more people that I had to make amends to because I was a blackout drinker. So anything that I could kind of think of, like, I had to put down. So I had so many more people that I needed to make amends to, and they weren't really, like, financial amends. Like, I only had, like, my parents' financial amends and, like, things like that. But, like, just sitting down thinking once I had, like, this God concept. Like, once I knew that God was flowing through me, my thoughts became so much clearer. Like life was so much clearer and I could see like, wow, like my mom lost countless hours of sleep. I spit in my mom's face. Like that was a person that I had become and just letting my mom see like me grow. Like she, my mom doesn't understand like AA and like it was really hard at the beginning. She's like the first like three months when I actually started doing things in the program, she looked at me and she's like, well now like, do you really have to go every single Friday night? Like, aren't you fixed now? Like you did your steps, right? And I'm like, mom, you don't understand. Like, and I love it. Like, I know it sounds crazy. I mean, like not probably not crazy to you guys, but I absolutely love it. Like I love AA. Um, I just remember making amends. And like, I remember with my parents, I had to make a living amends for a while. Cause that's what we have to do. Like I damaged them for so long that I needed to show up. I didn't know how to be a daughter. I had to start learning to be a daughter, to be a sister to my brother. Like, um, just be an active family member. And that was hard for me, like, to just show up and, like, it's not about me. Like, to hear my mom, like, how her day is, it's it's easy. Like, I didn't know it was so easy with a God in my life. Like, none of this would have been possible if I didn't find a God going through these steps. And that's basically what this program is for, is to find a power that is greater than you because obviously we can't do it or we wouldn't be sitting here. So obviously we need to find a power that's greater than ourselves to, like, fill the spiritual malady that we all have inside of us. Um... And my mom started to see these things. Like, it's crazy. Like, we really can't see the change. But, like, my family is like, wow. Like, I actually, like, listen to see how my mom's day is. Like, I don't call her and I'm like, hey, I did this today and I did this today. Like, bragging that I'm sober and, like, paying rent for once. And it wasn't about me. Like, just listening to my mom, like, makes me so happy that I can be in my mother's life. And, like, her being gay, like, I was so scared to, like, I use that a lot against her. Like when I go out drunk and she come home, I'd be like, it's your gay like that. You made me the way I am. I drink because you're gay. I drink because you're gay. And I made that like a clear fact to her every night. She'd find me drunk. That's all I could say. Like I've learned to say that in a blackout. Cause I've said it so many times that that's all that comes out. Like I'd spin her and be like, you're gay. Like that's how I get back at her. Like, and I didn't see any of that being wrong. Like I honestly thought that she was the problem. That it was her fault that I drank the way I did. That like she ruined my childhood, cheated on my dad with a female. Like that's not normal. So like I thought it was her fault. This had nothing to do with my mom. Absolutely nothing. Like this was all me. All me. I don't know if I was born with that. I don't know how to get into that. Like I know that I am an alcoholic and I need a spiritual solution in order to grow. And every day I'm growing. Um, I sponsor girls. It's a wonderful, wonderful feeling to like see somebody else grow from it too, to watch their family come back. And it's just so beautiful. Um, I was at work. I, I'm still a server because I don't have a license, which I am right where I need to be. And I'm okay with that. And I'm happy with everything in my life right now. And I just remember I'm sitting at work and this couple that comes in every single, every single week they come in and they get put in my section and I don't know who they are. I just wait on them. I know what beers they drink now. So I automatically see them in my section. I go grab their beers. They don't even have to tell me. Um, don't know their names, anything like that. Um, until one day, like it was maybe this happened recently, but two months ago, I was like relooking over my men's list because I had messaged this girl that I lived with that I turned her house into like a crazy like party animal house. Didn't have where I lived with the garbage bags. And I'm like, 
I really need to make amends to her. Like, I really need to make that right. So I messaged her on Facebook and asked for some of her time, and it said that the message was seen, but she never responded. And I lived there for about a month. She asked for me to pay $495 a month. Um, didn't pay anything. I stayed there for about 23 days, I believe it was. And she never responded on Facebook. So I'm like, okay, like, in God's time. That's exactly everything is in God's time. So I was just like, okay, like, it's not time. Like, when she's ready, she'll, she'll message me. So I'm taking care of this couple. And I remember one day I was training some girl. And I walk up to the table. And I'm like, here's your beers, guys. Like, I already knew what they had to drink. And the lady just, like, looks at me, and I was just talking about the day before I waited on them. I called my sponsor, and I'm like, I still haven't heard back from that girl. I'm like, I'm actually, like, have money, and I really need to give it away. Like, anytime I get money, it's because I need to give it away to make amends, and I'm okay with that. Um, so I'm like, I have money. I'm like, I think an amends is coming up because I actually have money to give away to somebody. And I told her that the day before, and the next day, this lady, I give her her beer. She looks at me, and she's like, do you know who I am? And it's an older lady, and I'm like, I have no idea who you are. I'm like you're my regulars. And they thought it was funny. Um, and they're like, no, they're the girl I lived with was Tara. They're like, she's like, I'm Tara's mom. And I just got this thing over my face and my heart just dropped. And I have a trainee and I'm starting to cry. And I'm like, this is not cool. I'm like, go stack dishes, do something, go somewhere. And just the day before, like I paid my rent. So I like had my checkbook and just threw it in my purse. Um, so I'm standing there at this table, and I didn't know what to say. I was, like, lost for words, and I kind of just was like, God, just, like, needed God. I needed him. And I, like, look at these people, and I'm like, I've harmed you. Like, I've harmed your daughter. I'm like, she won't respond to me on Facebook. And I guess the daughter lives with her. Like, when I moved into that house, she she had turned her – she moved into this house to try and better her life as well, and she went down the same path I did and started getting DUIs and losing jobs and – we parted ways and I haven't seen her since then. And I told her mom, I'm like, really? Like, I know you fix up that house. You put a lot of money into that beautiful house. I'm like, I put my cigarettes out on your floor. I spilled beers from beer bonging on your carpet. Like it was a beautiful home and I wrecked it. Like I really need to make this right. And the lady just looked at me and she's like, it's okay. She's like, um, she had talked about her daughter and like how her daughter was going down that path. And, um, I had a lot going on, so I left, and I go back into the break room. I call my sponsor. I'm like, she's like, well, do you do you have any money to give to her for that rent since it was a parent's house? And I was like, I don't I don't think so. And I walk back in, and I see my purse. My checkbook is sitting outside of my purse, and I'm like, perfect. So I get a check, and I write a $500 check to this table. Um, I waited till they were about to leave as they were going to pay their check, and when I presented their check, I presented my check. And I just had tears streaming down my face because I've been waiting so long. Like, I just came up in a conversation the day before. Like, if that's not God, I don't know what it is. And I remember, like, writing this check, and I put it down on the table, and the lady just starts crying. And I'm bawling as well, like my trainee's stacking dishes. And I'm just, like, bawling. And I have, like, an eight top behind them that's, like, drinking beers and getting wild for, like, the U.S. World Cup soccer game. And I was just like, oh, my God, they're going to see me crying. And I'm, like, standing here just straight bawling, tears of just, like, joy. And the lady looks at me, and she's like, my daughter's struggling. My daughter's really struggling, and I don't know what it is that you guys have. And I said, I'm an alcoholic. I'm like, I don't mean to scare you. I'm like, it's a beautiful thing. Like, being an alcoholic is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful thing to me. And I told her, I'm like, well, I'm an alcoholic. I'm like, I don't know if that's what your daughter has or if that's what she's suffering from. I'm like, but she probably has a spiritual malady that was as big as mine when I walked into these rooms, and she may need a solution. And I, the lady asked me, she's like, can I please have your phone number? So I wrote down my phone number to give to her daughter, like, if they ever needed help. And she looked at me, and she's like, I cannot take this check. She's like, it's a live and learn experience. She's like, as long as you learn from it and you stay on the path that you're on, like, I don't want your money. And that's kind of how my amends come. Like, I don't have to set forth out to make these amends like when they're it's ready to be made like god puts it in front of me like my life is god ran today like i don't need me i don't make great decisions i don't want to be running my own life because i am perfectly happy not running my own life and because of this program and god and awesome awesome sponsorship and the road trips we take to quaker town um kept me sober to this day and i get to help other girls and keep them sober to this day and like watch them make amends and get them jobs and give them advice and not really advice, but like I give them like my experience, like what worked for me and what didn't work for me. And I see girls going down the same path, like going to four meetings a day. And I just let them know, I'm like, 
honey, that didn't work for me. Like, it's a beautiful thing having these experiences. And everything that I did in the past was just things I did. It didn't make me who I was because I'm a totally different person now. And every single one of those things that I did has helped a new girl, at least one new girl in this room. So every, not this room, but in the room. So everything that I've done is for a reason. And I am blessed to have God in my life and everything that I have done in my life so that I can try and help other people because that's what I'm here for. Thank you very much for letting me see. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.